The Hebrew writer says, in speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. With that being said, our lesson title today is A Ball of Fire. We often hear about being on fire for God. You know, we read about the children of Israel in the wilderness. And we see that God led them through the wilderness. He led them on the way to the promised land. He was a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. And then as they built the tabernacle, the presence of God dwelled above the tabernacle as a cloud of fire. And when the cloud moved, the people would move. When the fire stayed, the people stayed. When we think about God as a pillar of fire, when we think about God as our leader in that way, we need to use the analogy of a fire to remind ourselves that we need to be on fire for God. That we need to be consuming like Him. That we need to be excited about who God is, what God has done. But in order for a fire to burn, there must be three key elements present. First, there must be something to burn. There has to be fuel. A fire will not burn without fuel. You remove the fuel and the fire goes out. A car that has an internal combustion engine that's what it's doing. It's lighting fires in the engine, explosions, but when there's nothing left to burn, the engine quits running. It stops. A fire left to itself will eventually burn out because it will burn up all the fuel. This is why when firefighters are fighting wildfires, you might see them cutting down trees, digging trenches, or even setting smaller fires to take away the fuel from the larger fire. They're trying to remove the fuel to help that fire go out. So we need to have fuel if we're going to be on fire for God. In reality, we are the fuel. We're the ones that need to burn for God. Sometimes we might think that, well, you know, I don't have the courage or I don't have the knowledge. I can't tell people about God because I'm afraid they might ask a question that I can't answer. You know, Jeremiah, in his time, he felt no one was listening to him. And sometimes I think we feel that way. That nobody's listening to the Word of God. And so he decided, I just won't speak of him anymore since nobody wants to hear. But if you look in verse 9 of chapter 20 of Jeremiah, look what he says. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. You see, when we're truly on fire for God, we can't hold his love in. We have to let it show. We have to let it out. We don't care what people might think. We don't care if people don't listen. We don't care if they don't respect us or don't appreciate it. If we're on fire for God, we're letting it out. That's what Jeremiah came to the conclusion. I can't hold it in. So the question now is, what are you made of and how willing are you to burn? You see, that's a question only we can answer ourselves. What am I made of, and are we willing to burn for God? Are we willing to give our life to Him? See, we have to be consumed by God. That's the whole thing. We have to be consumed. God has to be our life. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 12, 29, For our God is a consuming fire. He had just talked about how we worship and praise Him. And then he said, our God is a consuming fire. You see, if we love God the way we should love God, 
that's going to be what our life is all about. It's going to be the center point, the focal point. And we're going to be on fire for him. And people are going to see that because it's kind of hard to hide, hide a fire. It's kind of hard to keep it locked in. I mean, does love for God consume you? Does a desire to please God dominate your thoughts every day? Is God your all in all? See, again, that's only questions that we can answer as individuals. Where do I piss God? How important is God to me? Am I burning for God? Remember the words of Jeremiah. You see, when God is that important to us, we can't hold it in. It's going to come out. And it's going to show. Friends, we need to remember that we cannot be asbestos Christians. We must be able to burn. That's one of the prerequisites. You've got to be able to burn. You've got to be able to be on fire for God. God never called us just to be in an existence. He's given us duty. He's given us a purpose. He said there are things that he has created for us to do. If you remember when Jesus cleared the temple, yeah, it was probably shocking to a lot of people to see Jesus act this way because it was probably the first time they had ever seen him. This upset with this kind of, uh, of temperament. But John records in John chapter 2 and verse 17, he said the disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And of course, that's a quote from Psalm 69.9. But zeal for your house will consume me. We have to remember zeal for the house of God. Zeal for God. Zeal for his children must consume us. That must be, must be who we are and what we're all about. Being on fire for God. Lifting him up. Letting people see our fire burn. And serving him with all that we are. Because this is the only attitude you can have where you can truly and honestly serve God. Because God wants every fiber of our being. He wants every part of us. So we need to be on fire for him. The second element that we have to have is oxygen. You've got to have the right environment. Fire consumes oxygen. Most deaths caused in fire are from suffocation and not burning. It's from a lack of oxygen. Because a fire consumes the oxygen. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, maybe if you're a firefighter or maybe you've seen it on television. There's a house burning and they break a window or open a door and it just feeds that fire and it just burns way up. Because that oxygen causes it to do that. I mean... Maybe in school, they're probably not allowed to do that anymore, but when I was in school, they'd light a candle and put a glass over it. And what happens to the candle? It goes out. Why? Because you've removed the oxygen. You've taken away the correct environment. There are so many special foams and such that they have to fight fires. They're designed to remove the oxygen from the fire to help it go out. I remember when I was growing up in Guernsey County, Ohio, there was a, a big, big oil well caught on fire just north of us. And I don't know if you remember, but at the time this was, I don't know, late 70s, mid 70s, but they brought in a man named Greta Dare and he was the greatest firefighter when it came to fight oil well fires in the world. He was from Texas. Had a lot of experience. And I remember him explaining what they was having to do to try to get this out because it had been burning for days. 
and he was describing the foam and the things that they were using and how it worked to take away oxygen. To take away that oxygen in order to get the fire to go out. So to be on fire for God, <coughs> excuse me, we need to be sure that we are not smothering our oxygen. We've got to be in the right environment. We've got to be sure we continue to feed it. I mean, we look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 24 and 25. And here it says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good works, not forsaking our own assembly together, as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need to be together. I know it's kind of difficult right now, but we can still make phone calls. We can still encourage and we can be together on this right now. But we need to make it a point that when the church is together that we're with them. To be in that right environment. You know, maybe uh, you've heard the story of the preacher that went to visit a, an elderly fellow that hadn't been to services for a while. He knocks on the door, the, the man greets him, and they go over and they sit down beside the fire. The preacher picks up tongs, and he pulls a log off and sets it off to the side. And the two men just sit there in silence as they watch this log removed from the fire slowly lose its glow as the flames go out. And pretty soon it's merely smoking. With that the preacher got up, took the tongs, put the log back on the fire. He turned to walk away. And the gentleman looked at it and said, Lesson learned, preacher. I'll see you Sunday. You've got to be in the right environment. We've got to be with people who want to help us grow and help us burn. And of course, we must do those things that draw us closer to God. We've got to do the things that keep us close to Him. And that's not always easy. Because we live in a world that is continually pulling us away. That is tempting us to turn away and look a different direction. And so we got to do the things and be involved in the things that keep us close to him. We need to pray. We need to study. We need to worship. We need to live a more lifestyle. We need to be faithful. We need to be in such a way that we are improving our environment. You know, but really absence of any one of these things, then our fire is going to go out. You know, we can pray, we can study, we can worship, and we can be faithful, but if we're not living a moral lifestyle, that kind of helps our, our kind of gets into our faithfulness, but it's our fire is going to go out. We can do all the others, but if we don't pray, our fire is going to go out. Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is sealed at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. Friends, this is more than just thinking like God. This is reminding us, one, that everything on this earth is temporary. Everything here is just temporary. We want to put our minds on that which is eternal. And we want to live our life like we're living for eternity. Because this is going to go away. And when we live like that, when we think like that, when we do pray, we study, we worship, we live a moral life and we're faithful, man, we are going to be on fire. And that fire is going to burn bright. And that fire is going to be passed on to those around us. It's going to be encouraging. 
to them. So, where do we get this oxygen that we need? Because it's not the oxygen that we breathe. We only need to look at the first century church. As the church began in its infancy, in Acts chapter 2, in verse 42, the Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. You see, the right environment, oxygen, comes from the Word of God. It comes from being faithful to that Word and following that Word of God. Not trying to change it, not trying to do things differently, but dedicating ourselves, devoting ourselves to the Apostles' teaching and fellowship breaking of bread and prayer. See, that's important. That's important for building us up and keeping us strong and keeping us on fire. That's where we need to be. Finally, the third element is ignition. That which lights the fire. If you keep the fuel beneath ignition temperature, then it's going to go out. I mean, that is the goal of firefighting. Get that material below its ignition point because different materials have different temperatures at which they ignite. Most fire extinguishers are either going to be water or dry chemical, and that's their goal. Let's bring the temperature of the fuel down. Bring it down so it's no longer at a point where it can burn. So it's important that as people wanting to be on fire for Christ, that we keep our temperature up above the ignition point. So that we remain on fire. How do we do that? How do we stay above our ignition point? Well, there's a lot of different ways. But Paul in second, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22, he says, Avoid every kind of evil. Well, certainly that's one way. Because when we allow that evil to influence our life, that ignition point is going to come down. You know, I've heard a lot of Christians that are involved in things that, I'm not going to say they're sinful, but they're questionable. But they say, oh, I can handle it. It doesn't affect me. Friends, it does. You may not see it. You may not realize it. You may not even feel it because it's usually so gradual. But you know what? It's affecting you. And it's bringing your ignition temperature down. It's bringing your temperature down below the ignition point. And you will lose your fire for God if that's the way you continue. So we got to avoid every kind of evil so that we can keep it up. But how do we get ignition in the first place? Well, one of the best ways is to read the promises of God and believe those promises and know that they are given directly to us. That will set us on fire. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. No greater gift will we ever receive. And that should light us up. Knowing that, that my God, the creator of this universe, the God... Who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? The God who's in control of it all? He's given me the gift of eternal life. Me. And we all can say that. We can all look at ourselves in the mirror and say, God has given you, God has given me eternal life. In Christ Jesus. Man, that should set us on fire if nothing else does. Knowing that God loved me so much. That he done that. 
You know, sometimes that ignition will come from something we hear in a Bible class. Something ju that just clicks. Maybe in a sermon, we hear something that just, in our mind, makes us just all of a sudden perk up. And that fire lights. Maybe it's the announcement of something that the church is going to be involved in, and that gives us a spark. You know, ignition can come from many different places. You know, I remember being involved with different congregations. And we've got different people involved with, with different ministries that would normally involve. And then the, the growth that you would see is amazing. And it was just that spark that started. You know, we've also seen it the other way. I've seen young Christians come up out of the waters of baptism. It's burning to serve God. It's having a desire to share the gospel with everybody. To be involved in everything. But sadly, some of the more mature Christians quench that fire a little bit. You need to slow down. You need to not be so excited. Friends, we need to be excited. I mean, it's amazing what God has done for us, and it's even more amazing what God can do through us if we just depend on Him. If we just allow Him to use our lives, if we burn for Him. But we can get that spark from many different places. And then we can burn. When we reach our ignition temperature, we are going to be on fire for God. We're going to want to do things for Him. We're going to want to serve Him. And we've got to keep ourselves above that ignition point. And yes, yeah, sometimes it does get difficult. Sometimes we feel like, oh, we're the only ones. Sometimes we feel like that every time I turn around, somebody's trying to knock me down. But we got to do what we can do to keep our ignition point up. You know, not everything's going to go the way we think it should go. And that very easily gets us down and depressed and maybe our fire just starts to flicker. We can't let that happen. We have to give it to God. And so we, we keep our temperature above the ignition point by being involved in the work of the church. Whatever it may be. Whatever. There are all kinds of things that you can do to stay hot. To keep that temperature up. It doesn't have to be a, a foreign mission trip. It doesn't have to be some big glamorous ministry. People can bond and encourage one another and stay on fire for Christ by cleaning the building. Just by getting together and encourage one another. By doing things maybe behind the scenes. Oh yeah, when you get the opportunity to do those, those big things we might look at, oh, they do, they do set you on fire. And they do encourage you. But friends, when we serve God with the proper attitude, whatever it is He wants me to do, I'm going to do it wholeheartedly. You stay on fire for God. Your fire is always burning. I mean, there's so many things that God calls His children to do. And so many talents that He's given to all of His children. Not all of them are the same. That friends, all of them are going to serve the same purpose. When we use them to God's glory, that temperature stays up and we are on fire for God. And people say, well, I don't have much talent. I can't do very much. Well, if you feel that way, I mean, I think you need to overcome that one. But I just want to remind you what Jesus says in Mark 
chapter 9 and verse 41, he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. So maybe you feel like you're not very talented, but there is something you can do. Use it for the glory of God. That's what's going to keep you on fire. See, we need to be a church on fire. And as long as we stay together, as long as we encourage one another, we will be on fire. You know, the story is told uh, of a church building one day that had caught on fire and all the members had gathered in a field adjacent to the church building and watching it, most of them with tears in their eyes as they watched their building burn to the ground. And the preacher looked around and he saw a man off to the side, just off from the group that he didn't recognize. So he walks over and he says, friend, I don't think I've ever seen you in our congregation. The man looked at him and said, no, sir, I never have been. But I just came to watch because I've never seen this church on fire before. Ouch. That hurts. We don't ever want to be an example of that. We want people to see us as burning for God. We want to be a bright light. So if we would ever leave the community, people would say, we're going to miss them. But we want to be a place where they know they can come and they can be ministered to. We want the members of the body to know they can come and they can be comfortable and they can be welcomed and they can be encouraged by their brothers and sisters. We may start out as a spark or even a small ball of fire. But if we keep our fuel, we keep our oxygen, and we keep our temperature up, we're going to become a larger ball of fire. And we're going to be serving God. But friends, it's all of our choice. Where do we want to be? What do we want to do? Do we want to be on fire for God? And that's only answerable by you, the individual. The elders can't make you be on fire. The preacher, the deacons, other members. Well, we can encourage, we can offer you the things you need. But ultimately, each of us have to look in the mirror and decide if we want to be on fire for God. And I pray that you do. I pray that you do. So take it to God in prayer. Maybe you are burning for God. Go to Him and ask Him to help you keep that fire burning. Maybe you feel like your fire has been going out, especially through this time. Take it to God and ask Him to lead you something where you can get those flames fanned and burning once again. Friends, we want you to be a ball of fire. Think about that.